so good afternoon uh, let's begin so last time we were looking at uh, gaussian elimination with pivoting we described the process which involves using um, uh, these uh, rotation matrices so today we will uh, uh, and towards the end of the class we started looking at other modifications to the lu decomposition and uh, we sort of were working our way up to this decomposition we'll discuss today which is known as cholesky decomposition and we'll also discuss some uses of this Cholesky decomposition. So just to recall, at the last class, in the last class, we saw that uh, if a matrix A If matrix A is symmetric and non-singular, then um, uh, this this uh, in the in the decomposition L D M transpose um, L is equal to M, which means that we can write uh, we can find a lower triangular matrix L such that uh, A is equal to L D L transpose exists, where L is lower triangular and D is diagonal. Okay. So this kind of a decomposition exists. Now, um, don't confuse that the entries of D are the eigenvalues of the matrix. They are not. In general, they are not. D are some diagonal entries, and uh, this is the LDL transpose decomposition. Um, one thing is that uh, the eigenvalue decomposition of a matrix is not something that can be uh, done in using a polynomial type time procedure like we are describing here. Uh, whereas uh, these kinds of LU decomposition or LU LDM transpose decomposition or LDL transpose decomposition, these are uh, you can write down a, a polynomial time algorithm that can uh, actually find this decomposition. Whereas to find the uh, eigenvalue decomposition, you need to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors for which you need to typically use iterative procedures or uh, some other techniques to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so uh, so the D is a diagonal matrix, but those D, the entries of D are not the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay, so now we'll discuss about uh, Cholesky decomposition. So, um, I need one definition which we're going to use very heavily in the coming classes, and that is that of a positive definite matrix. So A in C to the N cross N is positive definite if it is Hermitian and x Hermitian AX is strictly greater than zero for all non-zero vectors in C to the N. Okay, and uh, we will write this as A some uh, slanted greater than zero. Okay, so another way to define a positive definite matrix is a matrix is positive definite if it is Hermitian and all its eigenvalues are strictly greater than zero, but we'll come to that. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, this definition is enough. So this is that of a positive definite matrix. Okay, 
Okay, so now um, the first result we have is that if A is is symmetric and positive definite, actually this is for the real case, and positive definite, which I'm going to abbreviate as PD. Then there exists a lower triangular matrix G with positive diagonal entries such that A is equal to G, G transpose. Okay, so instead of an LDL transpose decomposition, we have an G, G transpose decomposition. So um, why is this true? It's because, uh, so first of all, uh, A is positive definite and symmetric. So that means that uh, X transpose AX is strictly positive for every non-zero X in R to the N. Which, uh, so we, since, since A is uh, um, a positive definite and X transpose AX is strictly greater than zero for all non-zero X, it means that the matrix X is uh, non-singular, so it admits, it's symmetric and non-singular, so by the previous result, it admits uh, a, an LDL transpose decomposition, and so that means that X transpose LDL transpose X is strictly greater than zero. And uh, since um, A is positive definite, it means that um, uh, um, the matrix L here is going to be non-singular, rather full rank. And so if we let um, is full rank, which means that uh, if we let y equal to L transpose x, then what we have is y transpose dy, just substituting, is greater than zero. And this is true for every y not equal to zero. And uh, this in turn, this holds if and only if DII, D is a diagonal matrix. So each of, so you can, for example, choose Y equal to E1, that will pull out D11, and that is greater than zero. Then you can choose Y equal to E2, that will pull out D22, and that is greater than zero. So DII is greater than zero for I equal to one, two, up to N. Okay, and since DII is greater than zero, we can define G to be equal to L times this diagonal matrix containing square root of D11, uh, square root of D22, up, up to square root of DNN. Then, um, then A equal to G, G transpose, and G is the lower tri triangular matrix with uh, no with uh, with with positive entries along the diagonal. Okay, this is as desired. Okay, so one thing is that uh, this uh, Cholesky decomposition 
uh, where you're only looking for a G matrix such that A equal to G, G transpose. It, uh, since A is positive, definite and symmetric, it can be done with uh, half the number of uh, flops as compared to the vanilla LU decomposition. And the other thing is that because A is positive definite, it turns out um, that the computation of the LU decomposition is stable without using pivoting. So you don't need to do this uh, pivoting step that we discussed in the previous class. So here is how you compute the Cholesky decomposition. You can do it more efficiently than LU because of the following. Okay, MATLAB has a built-in command uh, CHOL of A and it will directly give you the Cholesky decomposition of A. So we'll illustrate this for the 3 cross 3 case. But you'll see that the idea applies to any, any dimensional matrix. So in the case of 3 cross 3 matrix, we are interested in, um, uh, in solving for the matrix G where it has the structure G11, G12, G22, G, sorry, this is G21. This is G31, G32, G33, and zeros everywhere else. This is G. G transpose will then be G11, G21, G31. Um, zero, G22, G21. Uh, sorry, G0, G22, G32, and 0, 0, G33. This product should give me the matrix A11, A12, A13, OK, so then by following a proper order in trying to figure out these G, I, Js, you can actually compute uh, each of them quite easily. So for example, if you compare the 1 comma 1th element, so the 1 comma 1th element here is G11 square. That is equal to A11. And then taking the positive square root, we have G11 equals square root of A11. So this, uh, whether you take the positive or negative square root gives you some flexibility in computing the Cholesky decomposition. But if you restrict yourself to taking the positive square root each time, then the computations are unique. So the Cholesky decomposition is unique. And then what you do is you look at the first column of the product. So that will be, the, the next entry will be G21 times G11. So, or more generally, GI1 times G11 is equal to a i1 which implies that uh, g i1 will be equal to a i1 divided by g11 and es essentially the fact that um, the matrix a is positive definite implies that uh, this a11 will be strictly positive because if you recall x transpose a x equal is greater than zero for all non-zero x so if i take a x to be equal to e1 that extracts the entry A11, and therefore A11 should be strictly greater than zero. So I won't be dividing by zero here. This is I equal to two to N. So all elements in the first column of G are now already determined. And uh, similarly, if I look at the second column, uh, the first entry will be, um, will be this times this, which will be G11, G21, but I already know what G11 and G21 are, so that doesn't give me any new information. Um, actually, this matrix A is uh, symmetric, so these two will be the same. So maybe just to avoid con confusion, I will write this as, I'll do the following. This is A12, 
this is a13 and this is a23 okay so the, the this times this gives me g11 g21 equals a12 which is the same as what i got over here g11 g21 equals a12 <coughs> nothing new from that equation excuse me um, but if i take the 2 comma 2th entry i have g21 squared plus g22 squared equals a22 which is this entry here which means that uh, we already know what g21 is uh, sorry we uh, already know uh, yeah we already know what g21 is we gi1 we know i equal to 2 to n and so we since we know this we can then compute g22 to be equal to the square root of a22 minus g21 square and the positive definiteness of a ensures that this quantity will be uh, always positive um, this is something these kind of things are something we will see later but uh, uh, it is a it is indeed a consequence of the fact that uh, the matrix a is positive definite so that ensures that this is always greater than zero okay um, and uh, so since now g22 is known then um, the second column which is uh, essentially now g32 sir sure. yeah uh, sir, uh, as you uh, changed the entries uh, because of symmetry, you changed the subscript things. Uh, the second line of your proof, uh, like it's not directly having any entry at a. You wrote uh, a i one, so a two one, a three one is not directly present kind. Of. Okay, you can make that small correction. Call this a a one nine. Okay, so and so on. But you're right. This um, uh, a, a to one, but the end, but the idea is that whatever entry I put here, you know it because I'm just writing the entries out here. So you can always determine these GI ones. So basically, the so basically we this is how you can efficiently determine the Cholesky decomposition of a matrix A. Now, if A equals GG transpose, then um, in order to solve uh, AX equals B, what we do is we first solve G times Z equals B. So basically, G transpose X, I'm calling it Z. And so GZ equals B, and you solve for Z. And G is lower triangular, so you can solve this efficiently using forward substitution. And then you solve G transpose X equal to Z. And uh, solve for X. Now G transpose will be upper triangular, and so you can do backward substitution and find X. So, uh, this Cholesky decomposition, like the LU decomposition, is useful to solve for uh, solve a system of linear equations. So, uh, as I mentioned, if you take the positive square root at each step by the by the way we've developed it, it is clear that this Cholesky decomposition is unique. And um, um, oh, yeah, so this so I'll just make that note here. If always take the positive square root the Cholesky de decomposition is unique and the other thing is that um, since a equals gg transpose this is like writing A as the product of something times its transpose. It's, an, it's a matrix analog of the square root operation.
but uh, the difference is that uh, the square root of a matrix is not unique. So in particular, if I take, um, uh, if I consider G times Q, where Q is any um, orthonormal matrix, then uh, if I take GQ times um, GQ transpose, then that is also equal to GG transpose. Um, which is equal to A. So GQ is also a valid square root of this matrix A. So it's not unique. So for example, another square root could be V times the diagonal matrix containing lambda 1, square root of lambda 1, square root of lambda 2, up to square root of lambda n. So this also, if I take this times its transpose, it will give me V times lambda, I mean, a diagonal matrix containing all the eigenvalues times V transpose. And because, uh, so these are the eigenvectors and these are the eigenvalues, then uh, remember that the eigenvalue decomposition is of the form AV equals V lambda, where this is a diagonal matrix containing lambda 1 through lambda n. And so uh, uh, A is equal to V lambda V transpose, so this is also a valid square root. So there are many square roots that are possible. But the Cholesky decomposition is a unique square root in the sense that we've taken the positive uh, uh, square roots at each step. And what you're getting is a matrix G, which is lower triangular and has positive diagonal entries. So if you restrict to, uh, re restrict to square root matrices that have these two properties, that it should be lower triangular and it should have positive diagonal entries, then the square root of the matrix is unique. Okay, now now if we have a uh, one small point here is that what I need here is that QQ transpose must be the identity matrix. Okay, so Q need not even be a square orthonormal matrix. It can be any matrix such that Q, Q transpose equals the identity matrix. So it could be of size N cross K with K greater than or equal to N. Um, and still this will work. So the square root of a matrix in, in this sense need not even be a square matrix because GQ will then be of size N cross K. Now, uh, another point is that um, if we consider uh, if we have uh, a zero mean um, vector process, xi in r to the n. So this is a random process. So maybe for, I'll write it as capital xi. Okay. Um, and suppose we have m samples of this random process. And suppose that m is greater than n. So you have more number of samples than you have uh, than the dimension of each of the vectors. Then we can form the, the matrix X, which is a concatenation of all these like this X. X1 transpose, X2 transpose. XM transpose 
and this is uh, this is going to have m rows and n columns then uh, then each row here is a sample um, xi transpose then an estimate of the covariance matrix um, R is R is equal to one over M times X transpose X. Okay. Um, so you might have seen this, for example, in this form, one over m sigma i equal to one to m xi xi transpose. Okay, so this is a this is a way to estimate the covariance of uh, this uh, may this ve vector process x, and this is uh, this has some properties that you will see uh, possibly in your detection and estimation class next term. Um, but for now, just say that this is the estimate of the covariance of X. Now, um, um, if we have, um, I'll call it R hat, the true covariance matrix is R, and this is the estimate obtained using M sample, so we call it R hat. Now, if uh, X is equal to Q times U, where this is the QR decomposition. So this is, uh, remember that this is M by N. So this matrix would be M by M. And this U would be an upper triangular matrix uh, of size M by N. Um, and this is the QR decomposition. Of X. I don't want to write R because I said the true covariance is R, so I write it as U, um, where... Sir? Yes? Sir, if U is not a square matrix, so how can we like, write like a triangular matrix, sir, upper triangular? Upper triangular just means that there's nothing below the main diagonal. I mean, it's all zeros below the main diagonal. So that's what I'm writing here. So this is of size uh, M by N. It has more rows than columns. It's a tall matrix. And this is the first N rows. And this is the remaining M minus N rows. They will all be zeros. Okay. And uh, U zero is upper triangular. Okay, with positive entries uh, along the diagonal. So we'll choose the QR to ensure that, okay. Then U, U0 transpose is, um, is the Cholesky factor of MR hat. That is um, MR hat okay, is equal to X transpose X, just from this itself, and that is equal to U transpose Q transpose Q U, and Q transpose Q is the identity matrix, and so this is equal to U transpose U, where U has the structure, which is equal to U zero transpose U zero transpose, considering the block matrix multiplication. Sorry, U0 transpose U0, which is equal to, I can write, think of this as GG transpose because it has the structure that U0 is upper triangular with N positive entries along the diagonal. So this is like my G transpose matrix and this is my G matrix. So U tra U U0 transpose is the same as G. So, um, so what this means is that uh, the, the, the U0 resulting from the QR decomposition um, from the QR decomposition 
of x is in fact the Cholesky, uh, the, in fact the Cholesky, in fact the transpose of the Cholesky factor of m r hat. m is just a scalar, so in fact it is uh, a scaled version of that. 1 over square root of m times u0 would be the transpose of the Cholesky factor of r hat itself. So, um, continuing with these points, um, this uh, Cholesky decomposition is useful for uh, for example, if you want to generate a vector process with a desired covariance matrix. This is useful for simulation purposes. So, uh, so suppose um, we want to generate um, an x, which is in R to the n, uh, with a desired covariance matrix. And uh, let's call that desired covariance matrix sigma. Symmetric. Any covariance matrix is by definition symmetric, positive definite covariance matrix. Okay, then what we can do is, um, um, so we first find, um, since sigma is symmetric and positive definite, um, we can find A G such that sigma equals G G transpose. Then what we do is uh, we say we start with a, a vector W which is in R to the N be a random variable such that its covariance matrix expected value of W W transpose equals the identity matrix. So generating such, uh, these are called isotropic dis isotropically distributed random vectors is easy. Um, so you just generate vectors with independent and identically distributed entries. Then expected value of WW transpose will be uh, uh, 1 if the variance of each of those uh, entries is equal to 1. Then, um, then we define x equal to g times w. Then um, the expected value of x, x transpose will be equal to the expected value of g, w, w transpose, g transpose, which is equal to, g is just a linear operator and expectation is also a linear operator, so I can exchange them and pull the expectation inside and uh, pull the G transpose out from the other side. So this is G times the expected value of W, W transpose times G transpose, which is equal to G, G transpose. Is equal to Sigma. So we have generated random vectors that have this desired covariance matrix Sigma. This is useful, as I said, for computer simulations for creating vector processes with a desired covariance matrix. The converse of this is uh, what is called whitening, which is also very useful because um, uh, we, uh, when, we are, when, when we have, for example, um, a stationary random process Xi, which is R to the N and I equal to one, two, et cetera, and uh, suppose we get to observe, uh, or we get to observe these excise with um, 
xi being equal to some si plus vi, where si is uh, the signal plus vi is the noise. Um, and uh, this vi being the noise is colored. Meaning the expected value of vi, vi transpose is not the identity matrix, but some other matrix sigma. Okay. It's not equal to the identity matrix. So suppose this sigma is known. So you, somehow you have access to independent noise samples from which you are able to estimate the noise covariance matrix. And suppose sigma is known and is positive definite. Then, um, then, uh, then there is a G such that sigma equal to GG transpose. So let G be such that sigma equals G G transpose. Then what we will do is uh, we pre-multiply Xi by G inverse. by G inverse. What that gives us is G inverse times Xi is equal to G inverse times Si plus G inverse times Vi. Then the new noise covariance matrix is the expected value of G inverse VI, VI transpose, G inverse transpose, which is equal to G inverse expected value of VI, VI transpose, G inverse transpose. And uh, this is just sigma, so that is equal to G inverse sigma G inverse transpose which is equal to G inverse G, G transpose, G inverse transpose, which is equal to the identity matrix. So we whiten the noise. So the resulting noise is white. So basically this uh, 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 this Cholesky decomposition is very useful in noise whitening, which is a very important tool in signal processing. And in particular, uh, Cholesky is used because it's stable and it's easy to compute. Okay. So just to summarize what we've seen in this, uh, seen so far in this chapter, is that we... We looked at the Jordan canonical form. Where the main um, uh, working block was this Jordan block. Which has the form lambda along the diagonal and once on the first super diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And we saw that in the Jordan canonical form, any A can be written as S times a matrix that contains some Jordan blocks. We can call it J N1 of lambda 1, J N K of lambda k and zeros everywhere else times s inverse and we call this matrix j which is the jordan canonical form of a and uh, here these n1 n2 their block sizes are such that n1 plus n2 plus etc plus n k is equal to n and uh, lambda 1 through lambda k 
are the eigenvalues of the matrix. And uh, these eigenvalues are not necessarily distinct. And, um, and and further, if I if I look at the summation of n i over all i such that lambda i equals some particular value lambda, this gives me the algebraic multiplicity of lambda. And if I look at the sum of i equal to 1 to k, I just add 1 each time lambda i equals lambda. This counts the number of blocks in which this eigenvalue lambda appears in the Jordan canonical form and this is equal to the geometric multiplicity of lambda. And of course, see from this itself, you can see that the algebraic multiplicity is greater than or equal to the geometric multiplicity. If all these blocks are of size 1, then all these ni's are equal to 1 and these two will be equal. And so the, the matrix J or A is diagonalizable if and only if k equal to n i.e. all are one cross one blocks. Okay, and the other thing we saw, the next thing we saw was uh, how to find the JCF, Jordan canonical form. What we do is, um, there's a recipe we wrote out where the first step is to find all distinct eigenvalues of A. And then for each lambda i, eigenvalue lambda i, we calculate the rank of a minus lambda i times the identity matrix power k um, for k equal to 1, 2, etc. And the, we study the sequence of ranks. And uh, this sequence gives the orders of all the Jordan blocks of A corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda i. right here and for each eigenvalue and uh, one very interesting consequence of the Jordan canonical form is that A is similar to A transpose for every A. We saw that uh, A, the matrix A is convergent if and only if mod lambda is less than 1 for every eigenvalue lambda of A. Okay, this is also true for non diagonalizable matrices. And then um, we discussed a bit about uh, the minimal polynomial. which is a monic polynomial, that is the leading coefficient equals 1. 
and smallest degree polynomial that annihilates A. That is, if I P such that P of A equals 0. And uh, this minimal polynomial is unique and divides any other polynomial that also annihilates A. And uh, the other thing we saw is that similar matrices have the same minimal polynomial. And the other thing is that the JCF can be used to find the minimal polynomial, although it may not be the best way to do it. Um, but what you do is that uh, if A has eigenvalues the distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda m then the minimal polynomial is of the form QA of T equal to the product I equal to 1 to M T minus lambda I power RI where RI is at least equal to 1 but it's equal to, uh, and in fact, Ri, Ri is the size of the, or the order of the largest Jordan block corresponding to lambda i. And uh, of course, A is diagonalizable if and only if Ri equals 1 for all i. It comes back to the point that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, all, all the Jordan blocks are 1 cross 1 okay, because Ri is equal to 1. And the minimal polynomial is of the form say t minus lambda one is it up to t minus lambda n. Okay, um, then we looked at other factorizations. which is the LU fact decomposition. And the LU decomposition with, uh, this is just nothing but uh, a Gaussian elimination. And LU decomposition with pivoting. which is a numerically stable way of computing the LU decomposition. And then we looked at Cholesky decomposition. And we briefly discussed about the use of LU in solving linear systems.
Okay, so this just sort of summarizes what we saw in this chapter so far. Okay, so um, with this, I conclude what I wanted to say about these matrix decompositions. Mm -hmm.